Welcome back. We are honored to be joined by Professor John Hasness for his second and final lecture of the seminar titled Two Theories of Environmental Regulation. Good evening. I'll start by thanking you all for spending an hour of your Saturday night listening to me. When this seminar was being originally organized, it was going to be done in person and in the original setup, I was scheduled to teach four lectures. When it was changed to the online format, I had to cut it down to two. And I feel kind of bad about that. So what I'll do tonight is tonight I'll give you two lectures for the price of one. So I will give you the lecture on two theories of environmental regulation. And I'll also give you a lecture that explains the solution to the problem of abusive policing all in one. So I'm giving you two for the price of one, but let me begin by talking about the two theories of environmental regulation. Most talks or most articles that discuss environmental problems start with a discussion of the article, The Tragedy of the Commons. And this lecture will be no exception. So I will start by talking about the Tragedy of the Commons. That was an article published in, I believe, 1968 by Garrett Hardin in Science Magazine. It's a famous article and it, it stands for three propositions. The first of which is very commonly known. Perhaps the other two are not as well known. So the second slide is, has the three propositions that are contained in the article, The Tragedy of the Commons. The first one is the one that's well known, and it's the claim that commonly held resources will tend to be overexploited. Uh, individuals who are functioning in a commonly commons get 100% of the benefits of whatever activity they're doing that exploits the commons, but they share the cost of their activities with everybody else. And Hardin illustrates this with the example of many shepherds who are grazing their sheep on common pasture land and all of the shepherds can uh, exploit the grass, which is what the sheep eat. And as long as there's less sheep, a certain, less below a certain number of sheep, which is called the pasture lands or the commons carrying capacity, the sheep can eat the grass, the grass has time to replenish and regrow, and the resource, which is the grass, is sustained and lasts. But if you add too many sheep, the sheep will consume the grass so quickly that it doesn't have time to germinate and it won't regrow. And then the resource, which is the grass, is dissipated, it's overexploited, and it's lost. And what Hardin points out is for every single shepherd who has a flock of sheep, every time one of those shepherds adds one sheep to the flock, he or she gets the entire benefit of the extra sheep because whether it's the wool or the meat, the shepherd gains the benefit of that animal. But each shepherd shares the cost of depleting the grass with everybody else, just bears a small part of it. And therefore it's in each individual shepherd's interest to keep adding sheep and getting more benefit. But if all of them act that way, then the carrying capacity is exceeded and the resource is destroyed. So what you have is the problem of each individual acting in his or her own interest in a commons destroys the resource. So that's the first observation that commonly held resources are over, tend to be overexploited. There's two other propositions in the tragedy of the commons. Perhaps they're not as familiar, but they're just as important. The second one is the claim that the tragedy of the commons cannot be remedied by appealing to the consciences of those exploiting the resource. So to illustrate this using Hardin's example, if all of the shepherds are doing this and they each understand that if they keep acting in this way, they'll all be wiped out, why can't they just get together and make an agreement and say, let's stop doing this? And the explanation is, if there were 20 shepherds each with a herd, you could, if you wanted to, rank the shepherds from one to 20 on how conscientious each one is. So there'll be someone who 
his word is his bond and he would never go back on his word. If he promises to do something, he would keep it no matter what. And then there's a lot of people who they'll keep their word most of the time, but there'll be somebody who's number 20 on this list who will only keep his word or her word if there's uh, everybody else is and is always tempted to sort of exploit things. And number 20 on the list reasons as follows. Everybody else is restraining their activity and not adding any sheep. If I add one sheep, that's not going to exceed the carrying capacity and I'll be better off. And so that person tends to add a sheep and maybe two sheep. Somewhere on this list is number 19. He's a little bit less unscrupulous. He would stick to the agreement, but he's not going to stick to the agreement if he understands that other people are defecting because he doesn't want to be a chump. So when he sees that somebody else is adding a sheep to his flock, he says, I'm not going to be the loser here. And that person starts to add sheep to his or her flock. The people at the top who would never violate their word and stick to the agreement no matter what, they don't add any sheep. The ones who are less scrupulous and less committed to their word, they keep adding sheep because they can gain and the resource isn't necessarily, and they think the resource isn't destroyed. And what happens is the unscrupulous get a competitive advantage over the ones who respond to appeals to their conscience. And over time, the people who respond to their appeals to their conscience are wiped out. They suffer such a competitive disadvantage that they disappear from the market. And Harden ex puts it the way Harden explains this as he says, in a, con in a commons, conscience is self-eliminating. So simply appealing to people's consciences won't solve the problem of the tragedy of the commons. And that's the second observation. And then the third observation is that there are only two solutions to the tragedy of the commons. One is you can restrict access to the common resource. And the other is you can privatize the common resource. Uh, there's no technological solution to this. Right. So the two, uh, the two solutions are restrict access or privatize. The reason why discussions of environmental problems usually start with this is because it's easy to apply this insight to environmental issues. So uh, because environmental problems usually arise from the exploitation of common resources. So think about air pollution. The air is a commons, it's held in common, no one owns the air. Companies can get rid of their waste products at very low cost by simply putting it up the smokestack and out into the air. That's a benefit to them. They get 100% of the benefit of cheap waste disposal and they share the cost of air pollution with everybody else in the country, which is just a small cost to them. The same is true of water pollution. You can get rid of your waste by putting it out in pipes into common rivers or water bodies of water. You get all of the benefit, everybody else, you share the cost of the pollution to everyone else, with everyone else. Other examples, if you are, logging on publicly held land. For every tree that you cut down, you get 100% of the benefit of the tree, but you don't bear any of the cost because it's not your property. So you share the cost of deforestation with the rest of the world, but you get 100% of the benefit of the logs that you take. You can make the same argument for endangered species. Anyone who takes an animal that's on the endangered species list because, if it's an elephant, because it has tucks tusks that are valuable, or for whatever the value of the animal is, the person who takes it gets 100% of the resource, but shares the cost of the depletion of the species with everyone else. So environmental problems are very, very often, or typically, are commons problems. So there's the starting point for the analysis of environmental issues. Now, let me go on and talk about what I think is the traditional public policy approach to dealing with commons problems. Okay. So I'll call this the standard public policy analysis. And this will sound familiar for those of you that were at my lecture the other night. So pollution or environmental degradation, those are the social costs of market transactions, there are negative externalities. 
people engage in activity where they get the benefit of the activity, they impose costs on everybody else. That's what happens in a commons. You're sharing the cost with everyone else. So what you have here is essentially a negative externality that's imposed on everybody else when you get the benefit of the transaction. And what do you do when you have to deal with negative externalities? You need outside regulation. The public, the standard analysis usually says that's legislation or public law. That's necessary to privatize the social cost, to internalize the externality. And therefore, the conclusion is that environmental legislation is necessary to avoid environmental degradation. This should sound familiar because essentially it's the market failure argument that I discussed the other night. The claim that environmental problems, this is the claim that environmental problems are an instance of market failure. And it's based on the view of the relationship between the law and the market that I had up last night. So I'll put it up again. All right, let me, let me just read this, then I'll put it up. What's wrong with this analysis that I just described? It assumes that the only solution to the tragedy of the commons is to restrict access. And there, you know, it ignores what I'll call the privatization option. And I'm going to say it fails to make the necessary comparative assessment. This is what I was talking about the other night. Right? The analysis I had up a moment ago is based on this conception of the relationship between the market and law. The market is people engaging in unregulated transactions. Law comes in and corrects those in order to achieve the public good. And the problem with that is it's not an accurate depiction of the way the law actually works. I remember I had an argument that led to this, a correct understanding of the relationship between the market and the law is one in which there's a part of the law that's built into the market, that's civil liability, that's common law. That's the part of the law that's internal to the market or endogenous to the market. And I talked about the dual nature of the criminal law, the um, common law system at the time. So, to reprise what I said last time, our legal system has two types of law. It has legislation, that's part of it, and there's common law, that's part of it. Legislation is the law that's constantly created by consciously created by political representatives. But the common law is case-generated law that arises from the settlement of actual disputes. And a quick reprise of this, because I'm going to use it to make the points about environmental regulation, the common law being case-generated law, it evolves. It starts originally from a desire, it started originally from a desire to avoid violence when there's human Con when human beings come into conflict, what people do when they want to avoid this kind of violence. At first, it's negotiated settlements to resolve conflicts. By trying a lot of different ways of resolving conflicts, people find out what resolves conflict successfully, and they continually repeat those successful con resolutions. They discard the ones that don't work. They repeat the ones that do work. Successful resolutions eventually become so common that they're cited, they become rules, they're a labor-saving device. And if, over enough time, they develop a normative force. One starts to believe that you should follow past resolutions because they've worked well. And by the 19th century, we get in our common law system, the doctrine of precedent, in which there's a basic rule that the courts say you should follow past decisions and you have a normative duty to do so. As there's changes in technology or social customs or mores or the social conditions change, then new conflicts, new conflicts tend to arise. People find new things that bring them into conflict. And as a result, there's more cases that come up and new rules of common law evolve to address this. And the resolutions of these new disputes, they can expand or contract the old rules and they can cause new rules to arise. So we have a system of law or rules that evolves as human social life evolves as well. Having given you a quick overview, I just did an overview of, let's say a thousand years of legal development. 
But the point of it in the current context is that the common law is the mechanism by which human beings privatize commonly held resources. Right, think about it for a moment. When a resource is held in common, and when the resource is plentiful, human beings can use the resource without conflict. When the human use of a resource is below its carrying capacity, then human beings can use the resource, there's no conflict, they're not running out of it, and it's held in common and there's no problem. There's no rules, there's no rights, people, when, people just use the resource. But as the resource starts to get used up, as it becomes scarce, as the carrying capacity is approached, then conflicts start to develop between the human beings over the use of the resource. And when conflicts start to develop, that's when common law rules tend to evolve. So let me illustrate that with a couple of examples. Let's talk about land. When we were hunter-gatherers and there was no agriculture, there was also no private property rights in land. You just went across the land chasing whatever game you wanted. There was no problem with approaching the carrying capacity of land. Once human beings learned how to plant crops and became agriculturally uh, astute and had a food supply in that way, then there could be conflict over land. Some land was more fertile than others. Some was in a good location, some was in a bad location. As the amount of available rich soil started to get scarce, conflicts developed between human beings. And the conflict over the use of land, it originally it, you know, might result in fighting. There will be a search for peaceful alternatives. It might begin with negotiations. But eventually what evolves is rules for the acquisition and the transfer of land, which now we refer to as property rights. But property rights didn't just appear. They evolved as conflicts over the use of land became more acute. And the result was what we now call property rights because the old saying, good fences make good neighbors is actually correct. Property rights allow people to stop fighting and figure out how to use land productively. Property rights, they're not, I'm not giving you a, a Lockean philosophical argument here. Property rights in the real world are never ideal philosophical rights to exclusive use and control. They're always very practical entities. Um, a good example is if you own land, you have a great deal of control over its use, but not 100%. There's a, something, an example would be, I, I can't sell land to someone that's fully enclosed by my property and then tell him or her that they can't cross my land to get in there. Why? Because if I did something like that, that wouldn't be something that tended to resolve conflicts. That would be a prescription for violent conflict. So if someone tries to alienate fully enclosed land, the law immediately brings into existence what's called an easement of egress and ingress, which allows people to go in and out. So that's not a perfectly, it's not a perfect property right that gives you exclusive use and control. It's the kind of right that allows people to cooperate and resolve conflicts rather than produce conflicts. It's not just land. I can give you examples of water. Um, rivers, or te rivers tend to be a common resource. Anybody can use them as long as anyone can use them without approaching the carrying capacity. They're used, there's no problem, there's no rules. But as human beings find new ways to use water and the population rises, some upstream uses can have negative effects on downstream users. And as a result, conflicts can develop between people upstream and downstream. And the common law method devises or evolves what are called riparian rights. And it's interesting the way riparian rights evolve. For instance, in the eastern part of the United States and in Great Britain, the value of rivers in the 18th, 19th century was, the, the, was its flow because the flow of the river turned the wheels that ran the mills. So what you wanted was a river that had a strong flow. Upstream users that did things that interfered with the flow would tend to cause trouble for people downstream. Conflicts would develop. 
as the conflicts developed and he attempted to attempt to settle them and the common law evolutionary process worked its way out, what you had was a system of rights that protected the river's flow, but not the water itself, because what was needed was something that would resolve the conflicts. In the Western United States, it was entirely different. In the Western United States, the value of the water was the water itself. It was, it's a dry country, it was needed for irrigation, it was needed for crops, mostly for drinking. There you needed rights that would protect not the flow, but the actual amount of water. So the water rights that evolve in the Western United States are not the same as the rights that evolve in the Eastern United States. The rights that evolve are rights that resolve the conflict and let people use the resource productively without exceeding its carrying capacity. What's happening is private rights are privatizing what used to be a commons. I won't go into it in great detail, but there's a great article I think I, I've referenced. It's called Towards a Theory of Property Rights by Harold Demsitz, and he describes how rights in wild game developed in Labrador when the Native Americans at the time were using it, there was no problem of taking too many animals. The carrying capacity wasn't being exceeded. When Europeans came along and started trading for the pelts, which were valuable, more and more and more animals started to be taken. The carrying capacity started to be approached. What happened? The people developed ways of creating territories in which you could hunt. Very, very sophisticated and subtle things. If someone needed an animal for food, they were allowed to take it and take the meat, but the rule was you had to leave the pelt on a stake, which indicated you just needed it for the meat you weren't trying to steal. And private rights evolve in such a way that protect the resource that's reaching the carrying capacity. If I have time before I'm done, I'll give you a, I'll tell you a story about the seahorse with, which illustrates all of this. So to summarize, when it's efficient to hold resources in common, when common resources can be used by all without conflict, well, common law doesn't interfere, there's no rules of law. But when holding resources in common can no longer be used without conflict, the common law process of conflict resolution creates property rights, it privatizes the commons. That's the way common law works. All right. The other part of our legal system, besides common law, is legislation. I'm going to describe legislation as a means of, legislation also is a way of dealing with environmental problems. I remember again my lecture of the other night, legislation is abstract rules of law that are consciously enacted by the political representatives of the community. Legislation is the regulation of voluntary transactions by the state. It serves whatever the politically dominant interest is. In the environmental area, one of the interesting features about legislation is that legislation tends to create commons. I described a moment ago, I described the common law as a mechanism for privatizing commonly held resources. Well, legislation is often a mechanism for commonizing privately held resources. So what are some examples of this? Um, when the United States acquired the Louisiana Purchase. It acquired a vast range of land. And some of that was put, you know, allowed for private ownership. But vast tracts of the Western United States are held in common by law. So the law creates a commonly held resource. The law creates a vast area of land for which there's no private ownership rights. And so when you have, there's some problems associated with this. The problem of logging on publicly held land is the problem of exploiting the commons. But that's a legislatively created commons. Another example is the mining law of 1872. That allowed private mining interests to mine on the publicly held land, on the land controlled by the government. It did and collect whatever royalties it wanted, you know, whatever it wanted to. It didn't have to pay any royalties to the government. It didn't have to clean up its mess. It could just exploit whatever minerals it wanted to. It got 100% of the benefit and it shared the cost of the environmental destruction with everyone else. Other examples of commons. Uh, 
uh, when radio became a medium of communication, people could send radio signals up for a certain amount of time without any problem. But as more and more signals went up, the bandwidth was limited. There, tended, there started to be conflicts. What can be done about that? Well, the federal government passed a law making the electromagnetic spectrum a government-controlled commons. It prevented the privatization and it gave out licenses so that it controlled the commons. The same thing, the Endangered Species Act is a way of protecting animals, which says all these animals are held in common. What I'm suggesting is that legislation in the environmental area is a way of either creating commons or protecting environmental resources by restricting access to commons. It's not privatization, it's restricting access. At endangered species, they're all protected by us, it's a commons, and we will punish anyone who tries to take the animals. The electromagnetic spectrum, it's a commons, we give out the licenses, anybody who tries to send a broadcast signal without a license is violating the law, is subject to punishment. And what you have is these two different approaches Legislation creates commons and then tries to protect the resource by restricting access. And common law is a way of privatizing the resource. Okay. Um, having said all of this, let me go back for a moment. Now, this was the analysis I gave. I said, what's wrong with the analysis? It assumes there's only one solution to the tragedy of the commons, which is to restrict access. The standard public policy analysis, which says that there's negative externalities, we need legislation in order to privatize the social cost. Well, legislation is a way of restricting access to commons. That's the solution. One of the solutions that will work according to the tragedy of the commons is restrict access. The legislative approach is a way of dealing with environmental problems that can work. It restricts access to the commons. But what's wrong with this approach is that it ignores the other option, which is privatization is an option as well. The, you know, the way our system works, we've got two ways of approaching environmental issues. Right? One is through legislation. That's a mechanism for restricting access. Legislation can creates or it maintains the commons and uses the threat of punishment to contain control's exploitation. So that's what happens with public land. It's a commons, it's maintained. You can only use it the way we say, we tell you, we control access. Electromagnetic spectrum is the same thing, endangered species is the same thing. And that common law is a, another alternative. It's the mechanism by which human beings privatize common resources. And it does that by aligning the individual incentives of the people who are using the resource with the preservation of the resource. I guess what the story of riparian rights and the Labrador fur trade are all about. It gets the people who are using the resource own self-interest lined up with preserving the resource. In the original example from Hardin, one way of dealing with the tragedy of the common for the shepherds is sell, break the pasture up into 20 different plots, each owned entirely by each shepherd. And then the shepherd bears 100% of the cost of adding a sheep as well as 100% of the benefit. And his interest is now not to exploit the resource to such an extent that the carrying capacity is exceeded. So these are the two options. What's wrong with the standard approach is that there's not, the standard approach doesn't make the comparative assessment. The right way of asking how to deal with environmental problems is always which one of these solutions will work better. Is it better to restrict access or is it better to try to privatize through the common law mechanism? So the proper policy analysis requires a comparative assessment of the common law civil liability mechanism of privatization with the legislative approach of restricting access. How will this come out? In general, I don't know. I would say that if you're in emergency situations or very time sensitive, like things are gonna be destroyed very soon, 
that's the case in which it's most likely that a legislative solution is necessary. If you don't have time to let the common law evolutionary process work, then that looks like a situation in which the best way to protect environmental resources is through restricting access through legislation. But I also think that in general, long-term problems favor co the common law approach. There's a lot of mechanisms by which the common law can privatize and protect resources. The lawsuits for trespass and for nuisance are great ways of, if someone does something that's interfering with your enjoyment of the land or destroying a resource, you've got private lawsuits you can use to put the cost back on the people who are engaging in this activity. Somebody's engaging in air pollution so that soot's coming on your land, you sue that person for trespass, you sue that person for nuisance. In our system, not only can you get damages, you can often get an injunction which tells the other party, you're not allowed to do that anymore. So that you're making the interest of the person exploiting the resource align with protecting the resource because to the extent that they are polluting, they're bearing the cost as the lawsuits puts the cost back on them. Evidence of how powerful the privatization approach is, is what I talked about last time, it's the tort reform movement. We've got people down in Washington DC lobbying the politicians, please protect our businesses against plaintiff's attorneys. They're out there regulating us to death. Plaintiff's attorneys are just as clever at protecting people's environmental interests as they are in protecting any other of people's interests. And if the problem with the tort system is that it's too regulatory at the moment, then that's an extremely powerful way, an extremely powerful mechanism for protecting the environment. So what, you, what I'm arguing is, if you want to protect the environment properly, you always have to make the comparative assessment. When I say there's two theories of environmental regulation, the two theories are, have a, the legislation preserve the commons and restrict access by punishing people who abuse it, or have the common law mechanism align the interests of the people using the resource with its preservation so that you are privatizing the resource. And those are the two ways of addressing this. Which is the better way of dealing with the resource. I have to say that it's something that you have to decide on a case-by-case -case basis. I already gave you my tendency. I think that the common law privatization method is the superior way to go unless there's some kind of crucial emergency where there's no time. I'll give you two examples and before we uh, break for questions. I told you I might tell you a story about the seahorse. That's what's coming up now. Um, I'll make a recommendation, uh, if you can find it. There's a wonderful television show. I have the, the disc of it from the 1990s. There was a PBS show, Nova. I think Nova's still on, but there's an old show, Nova, which was a science show. And there's a show, one of these Nova shows is called The Kingdom of the Seahorse. And it's a fascinating show. It's about an hour long. The first half hour tells you everything well, it tells you more than you ever want to know about the seahorse. It's, there's a woman named Amanda Vincent. She's a marine biologist. She loves the seahorse. She knows everything about the seahorse. They tell you how the seahorse is territorial. It always stays in one place. Its tail wraps around grass. It stays in one place. Interesting thing about the seahorse is that the male carries the babies. It carries like 100 babies at a time. And, you know, every, it just tells everything you want to know about the seahorse. But this woman's concerned because the seahorse is in danger of going extinct. And the, ex the reason for this is apparently at the, in China, it's believed that the seahorse has aphrodisiac properties. So seahorses are ground up and sold to people in China in large quantities. And there's fantastic demand for seahorse. And as a result, people all around the world especially in the Philippines, where the seahorses are plentiful, are taking the seahorses out of the waters, out of the shorelines, and selling them to China. 
And they're doing it at such a rate that they say horses can't reproduce fast enough. The carrying capacity is being approached. And she wants to preserve the seahorse. That's her mission. And the, in this show, you know, she's tried everything. She's gone through to international organizations. She's talked to the Philippines government. Nothing works. And then in the second half of the show, she just moves to and lives in this village along the coast of the Philippines. The village is called Hondaman. And she lives there for a while. And at first, no one wants to talk to her because apparently um, white-skinned people from the West who speak English have come there before and nothing good has ever happened as a result. It's always had bad effects for them. So they don't trust her. She's a, somehow foreign, but she just lives there and watches them for a while. And after a while, she notices that the seahorse fishers, they're taking pregnant seahorses out of the water. And the reason is if they don't take, if they find one and they don't take it, they don't get any benefit of letting the seahorse reproduce because somebody else will take it. So there's no benefit in letting the pregnant one stay in the water. And that's one reason why the seahorse population is being depleted. And so she shows some of the people in this village how to make floating mesh nets of a size so that you can put a pregnant seahorse in it and it can't escape. But after it gives birth, all the babies, 100 babies can get out and can be part of, you know, can, has a, have a chance to grow. And by putting their initials on each of these, they can preserve, they don't have to take the pregnant seahorses out, they can make, so, make it so there's more seahorses as a result. And the people start doing this and there's more seahorses. Now they're interested in what she has to say. So they listen to her. She says, why don't you take a certain area and designate it as a no fishing zone and any seahorse in there can grow and reproduce. And as the baby seahorses come out, they'll grow and you can have more seahorses that way. So they do that. And the result of her advice is the seahorse population is recovering in this area. And the people who are, whose livelihood depends on this, they seem happy. And if the show ended there, it would be a happy ending, but that's not where the show ends. Um, what happens is people up and down the coast find out there's more seahorses around Hondaman. And so at night they're coming and they're stealing the seahorses, they're poaching. And the next thing you see in this video is the people in Hondaman are out in their outrigger canoes with lanterns patrolling their area so that they can protect their seahorses and so they have to have an enforcement mechanism. And as that becomes effective, what happens is the people up and down the coast stop trying to poach and they come walking in and saying, what are you guys doing here? And she, Amanda Vincent and the others explain to her what's going on and they take the practices back to their village. When this show ends, this woman is teaching the people how to make private seahorse farms where you can be even more efficient. And what's interesting about the show is this was so successful and the seahorse population recovered so well that the Baltimore Aquarium had an exhibit on this called the Hondaman Project that was uh, going for many years in the early part of the 21st century. So that's a story that shows how aligning the incentives of the individuals who are exploiting the resource with the preservation of the resource is a good way of dealing with environmental problems. The other side of the story was the story of the green turtle, which was also an endangered species. And there was a green turtle farm, I think this is in the Caribbean, it's a green turtle farm, and the people there wanted to preserve the green turtle. So what they did was they would farm the green turtle each year. They would take a certain number of the animals and they would kill the animals and use the shells because the, these turtles were valued because they you made combs out of them. They had shed, their shells were valuable for all kinds of reasons, and they would sell these products as a way of keeping the turtle farm going and then make sure that larger and larger numbers survived. So the green turtle population was recovering until people who were concerned about the green turtle had the green turtle put on the United States endangered species list. That put them back in the commons. If a green turtle is on the endangered species list, none of its products can be sold. 
and the green turtle farm was dependent on shipping its goods through the port of Miami, and now it was illegal to ship those goods through the United States. And as a result of this, green turtle farm ultimately failed, and people went back to poaching, which is what was destroying the resource in the first place. But by holding the resource in commons and trying to restrict access, you destroy the incentive of the individuals to preserve the resource. I think I have a quote up here from Amanda Vincent that explains the difference between the two approaches. Yeah, okay, so at the end of The Kingdom of the Seahorse, here's what she says. In general terms, there are two approaches to conservation. Quite a number of people feel it's very important to protect the individuals of a species very closely by putting up fences or by putting trade bans on them. The other approach is just accepting that those animals cannot all be protected, not each and every one of them, you need to work towards ensuring the population survives and just some individuals will be killed and will die. The latter approach is more sustainable. And so we need to work very hard to integrate what people need with what the animals themselves need to build a future for both. So if you're concerned about endangered species, you have to make a comparative assessment. Do you want to go the privatization route, which is a common law approach or the approach that Amanda Vincent takes, or do you want to go the legislative route where the resource stays in the commons and you try to protect it by restricting access? It's a comparative assessment. I tend to think the common law route has some advantages. Right, the other example is going to be the BP oil spill from 2010. <clears throat> Now, the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico was a great environmental disaster. What accounts for this? Well, if you want to drill for oil in an economical way, where do you want to drill? Wherever it's cheapest. You'd like to drill on land. That's the easiest way of getting oil. But the problem is that vast quantities of the Western United States and Alaska are off limits to private drilling because it's a commons held by the government of the United States that doesn't permit drilling. Well, if you had to drill for oil and water, you'd want to drill in shallow water, like the continental shelves on the West Coast and the East Coast of the United States. But you can't because that's a commons that's, protect, that's held by the federal government and it doesn't permit drilling there. On the other hand, in the Gulf of Mexico, which is very deep, the federal government wanted people to drill there and it divided the land that it, the floor of the Gulf of Mexico, which is controlled, into areas which it tried to sell as oil leases. The problem was no company would buy an oil lease at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico because it was so deep that the risk of something happening that couldn't be abated, that couldn't be controlled, was so great that no company would run the risk of liability. The threat of tort liability meant that people didn't want to engage in this unreasonably risky behavior. That's what tort liability is for. It's a regulatory mechanism. Negligence says if you engage in unreasonably risky behavior and somebody gets hurt, you have to pay. So no one wants to buy the oil leases at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. What can the federal government do? It wants to make money. It's got these, these oil leases. Well, what it can do is engage in tort reform. Uh, it said, first of all, don't worry about it. We don't need protection through the tort system. We'll take care of things. We'll regulate things. It creates a federal agency, the Minerals Management Service, which is going to regulate for safety. It's 10 years later, you don't remember the stories, but at the time, the stories of how corrupted this agency had become by the oil companies were almost humorous. There were stories about the oil companies giving parties to these people and bringing in hookers and things like that. Anyway, the, it was not a very effective form of regulation. And in order to get companies to be willing to drill there, they passed the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 which was a tort reform measure. Here's the Oil Pollution Act. It says, 
except as otherwise provided, the total liability of a responsible party under this act is $75 million, which sounds like a lot, but that's a liability cap. That's a cap on damages. And the amount of money you can make drilling for oil there was much more than $75 million. This is a tort reform measure. What the federal government did was use statutes to encourage companies to engage in unreasonably risky behavior and drill for oil a mile down, where if something goes wrong, there was very little they could do about it. And they made it worth their while by removing the kind of regulation you get through common law and civil liability. They statutorily created a commons and said, don't worry, we'll restrict access through the mineral management service, which it didn't do a very good job of addressing. And when you want to make a comparative assessment, what you have is the common law system prevented people from drilling in this dangerous area, which can have disastrous environmental results. And you have to compare that with the legislative approach, which encouraged people to engage in unreasonably risky behavior so that the government could reap some money from selling its oil leases. That's, what the, that's part of the comparative assessment. I think, I, I'm not sure I have anything else, but I, I'm gonna offer you like a rule of thumb that I think you can apply much more generally than just in this area. So gen, for those of you that are interested in knowing how markets work, if you're like me and you're not an economist and you wanna know how markets work, here's like a rule of thumb that can help you do that. Yeah. So I'll call it Hazness's rule. If you wanna know how markets work, Look at legislation. Legislation only exists to do what markets won't do. Why is there an Oil Pollution Act of 1990? Because in a market, and remember the way I understand markets, that's markets that are voluntary transactions regulated by ethics, customary practices, and common law and civil liability. The way the market worked, no one would drill in this dangerous place at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico if the market was working. So you needed legislation to cause people to behave that way. If you wanna know how markets work, look at legislation. Legislation only exists to get people to do things that they don't do on the market. And to the extent that legislation frees people from civil liability, frees people from the effects of the common law, it encourages people to do things that are unreasonably risky and unreasonably dangerous. All right, let me stop because I, I have to leave some time for your questions. Um, I'll just stop there and take your questions. Let me see if I can stop sharing the screen and... Okay, so Jason, you can take over. All right. Thanks, Professor Hasnath. So we have uh, quite a few questions. We have uh, about 10 minutes for those questions. So we're not going to have uh, time to get through all of them. Uh, I'm um, from New York. I can talk fast. Okay. Yeah. So uh, here's the first one. Uh, what about abusive policing? Yeah. Okay. So I said I was going to give you two lectures for the price of one. I already have. Don't you see the implications? This, just take this lecture and you put, what's the problem of abusive policing? All right. Poli originally, the kind of services you need to protect people against injuries, that's police services, that's protective services. And in a market, anybody who engages in these kind of activities is subject to liability. If I want to act as a police officer, or if I want to engage in the business of policing people, and I engage in intentional wrongdoing, I'll be subject to lawsuit for assault, battery, for whatever, for false imprisonment. If I'm careless about how I treat people, I'm subject to lawsuit for negligence. Right? I, in, the, in, the, in the first world, in the world the way it used to be, your police have all of the incentive to behave properly. If the government takes over the policing service and makes it a monopoly that it controls and puts police services into the commons, it makes it a commons that it controls, and it says, don't worry, we'll make sure people behave properly, we'll control the commons, we'll just restrict access through our rules, 
but we won't hold any of the individuals accountable. The question is a question of comparative assessment. What's the best way of providing police services non-abusively to the public? Is it through privatization, which is everybody's subject to civil liability, everybody's subject to tort lawsuits in the way they would be, whether they're part of the police or not, or is it to create a commons that's controlled by the government through legislation and then say, don't worry about us, we'll regulate things properly. And by the way, the individuals, they can't be sued personally for anything they do wrong. If they do something wrong, the taxpayers will pay. They won't lose their job because police unions will protect them and will completely insulate them from any accountability. So the same case, the same argument I made with regard to environmental problems, it applies just as well to abusive policing. The question always is, do you want to go in a direction which aligns the incentives of the person, either exploiting a resource or engaging in police services with preserving the resource or doing the job right? Or do you want to create a, a commons and then depend on the government to regulate it in such a way that these people who have an incentive to behave badly will respond to punishment from departing. So we, I gave you two lectures for the price of one. How can common law be used to regulate environmental pollution when the damage done is aggregated over the long term, as opposed to a measurable damage to a single individual or his or her property at a given time? Such a, such a wonderful question. Uh, by the way, any professor who says it's a wonderful question, that just means we know the answer. Right. So the reason why it's a wonderful question, I, I love the common law because it continually learns, it continually evolves, it has, solves new problems. The common law used to be very individually oriented. In the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution comes along, there's big businesses, all of a sudden there's these cases that aren't covered well in the common law and something new evolves. It's called class action lawsuits. When you have actions that can affect many, many, many people in the same way, now you can bring a lawsuit for all the damage done and you get a class action lawsuit, which is the bane of big businesses. They hate that. Also, you get closer to the present time. It's not just class action lawsuits. Some actions create risk of injury that we don't know that's going to happen. It could be pretty far down the road. Like if you're exposed to a carcinogen, you don't know you're going to get cancer. What can you possibly do? Well, of course, what happens is the common law learns and evolves ways of dealing with this. So now part of the judgment that you can get when you are engaged in this actions is damages that involve medical monitoring, or you can get compensation for being exposed to certain types of risks. As we develop new technologies, as we develop new problems, the common law figures out ways of dealing with it. And ten, generally, it tends to do so in a way that's more effective than taking people who happen to sit in Congress or state legislatures and saying to them, okay, what should we do about this? They don't come up with better solutions in the abstract than a system that has to learn on the ground from actual cases tends to do. So the answer is you get class action lawsuits and that takes care of it. Using the sort of framework that you've given us this evening, how should we think about something like carbon trading? It's carbon trading, I'll generalize that. There's an approach that's taken to environmental regulation that's called cap and trade. So this is a mix of legislation and privatization. The government creates a cap legislatively, but then it says to everybody, you figure out how to achieve that cap, keep things below that cap most efficiently, I will let you trade back and forth. So if you can pollute less, you can sell your right to pollute to somebody else. And it uses market forces to protect the resource. That was done with sulfur dioxide. Usually I'm opposed to legislative solutions, but the uh, part of the Clean Air Act that dealt with sulfur dioxide and cap and trade not only it did better than it was required, it, the cap was lower than the legislative cap, and this will sound crazy, it made a profit. It didn't cost the government anything. So if you're gonna have a legislative approach, utilizing market forces is probably the way to go. That kind of hybrid is better than the 
we'll tell you what to do, we'll restrict access and just leave it to the regulators. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that you can't do the same thing without the cap part. If you, and if you let the common law work, over enough time, you can get the same kind of results by using market forces. You just get it so that the interests of the person using the resource are aligned with its preservation and then let people figure it out. Okay, we have time for one more question. How should we think about when legislative solutions might be the right answer? Is it based on the, the speed of the crisis, uh, its, it's long-term effects, what are, the, what are the variables that might go into making that decision? Okay, so I'll give you a serious answer, but, that, but it's not necessarily my answer. Right? The serious answer is there probably are cases in which the common law privatization method can't work because there's not time for things to evolve. If you're in a crisis, if it's an emergency, if something terrible is gonna happen unless you act now, you don't have time and that's where you need legislative action. So if you're, being careful and logical about it, you'll ask yourself whether you're in that situation or not. So that's the real answer. My answer is it never, it never works. And the reason is you can't trust the people who are, you can't trust regulators, you can't trust legislators, you can't trust the people who are involved to actually be interested in getting the right result. There's no way to eliminate political considerations from the legislative process. I'm not an economist. Maybe you've got other lectures about public choice. Legislation is always the politically dominant interest, not the common good. If you figure out how to make the legislative actors actually act for the common good and not act in the politically dominant interest, then I'll be willing to sign on and say there are cases in which you should regulate environmental issues legislatively. But until you get there, I'm gonna be stick with the common law method, even though it will fail sometimes, because you just because you have to compare the real world solution with the real world solution. Not here's the way the common law works compared to the way the government works if it was doing the right thing. It's gotta be here's the way the common law works with its flaws to the way the regulatory mechanism works in the real world, and ask yourself which one's more likely to give you a good result. I am hard pressed to find an example where the legislative approach wins out in the comparative assessment. But that's all for you all. Figure it out yourself, make the comparative assessment, make it realistically. You know, don't say the government's gonna do this. Say something like the government that's currently controlled by the Trump administration is gonna act and see if you still think that it's a good solution. 